All right. Well, I've got uh, the pleasure of having Rich Carell in the studio. Thank you for coming down here. Thanks, Jason. Happy to be here. And so when I walked in to the studio, I noticed that it looks like a, a horror scene from uh, like a movie, like a sci-fi movie or something. And and I imagine that these aren't things that you just go to Walmart and purchase. No, 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 no. <laughs> I've spent my whole career in comedy, but my hobby has been collecting science fiction, fantasy, and horror film memorabilia. So this has now turned into the biggest collection in the world. Huh. And when I talked to your f folks about coming down, I just said, do you want me to bring some stuff? And they went, yeah, sure. Uh, so this was just stuff that was laying around the house. Um, and I don't, live in, I, don't live in, I don't live in the Adams family house. I live in a completely normal house. <laughs> but collectors in auction houses approach me like three times a week uh -huh. because I collect so much stuff. So I had some things here I thought you might think are fun. Uh, uh, and recognize. Of course. Yeah. Well, for those that are just tuning in from the audio only version, there's about six or seven pieces here. Why don't we kind of go through them? It looks like they're guests on the uh, podcast episode. I'm going to share my mic with this guy right here. So let's start with him. Who okay, the first guy you're looking at is Bela Lugosi. That's how he appeared in 1931 when Dracula came out okay. in February 31. That's made off his life cast, so that's as close to his real head as you're ever going to find. And I have guys put these things together for me to do punch terror, acrylic teeth, glass eyes. So that's really Lugosi's head as he was in Dracula, which was his most famous role. Hmm. <clears throat> the guy next to him is Robert Englund, who appearing as Freddy Krueger, and that head's from Freddy Three. Now, Robert Englund was a Shakespearean actor who, a lot of people think he was British, he wasn't, he's an American, but he was a Shakespearean actor <clears throat> who happened to take over this one part as Freddy Krueger. And then in the 80s, those movies, the Nightmare on Elm Street movies took off. Yeah. So he became like the Boris Karloff of the 80s and early 90s, and he's the nicest, nicest guy. Huh. Most of the villains were always really nice guys. It's usually but that he was way. super nice. I directed him in a show called Married, Married with Children, and he played the devil, huh. and he was hilarious. <laughs> but he was like the nicest guy, great to my son, and so he was very sweet. This is a head of Michelle Pfeiffer, one of these other things is the head of Michelle Pfeiffer from Batman Returns. Uh, that's 1992, and she's wearing her original Catwoman cowl. Okay, they made a number of these in various stages of deterioration. This is one of the later ones when it's starting to fall apart, but, but I mean, they did that on purpose. Huh. But this is one of the originals. I have her whole suit, and that's on a display down in Hollywood. Cool. Yeah, okay. so that's from Batman. The coolest thing at the table is this hammer there's this great big sledgehammer here. Uh -huh. Okay. Did you see Misery? And is it a real hammer? Is it heavy? No. It's not. Okay. This looks is, like This it. is a foam head. Okay. But did you see the movie Misery of with Kathy Bates uh -huh. and James Con Okay. Yeah. The, mo the most famous scene in that is the hobbling scene where she breaks his feet. Yes. This is the sledgehammer she uses. That's to break the his exact feet. sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I just God. think that's so cool. It is cool. And you can well, see I get very excited about these things. I'm like a little you're kid. Like a, you're, not, you're like a kid. Oh, yeah, in I, an I just love body. it. It's so cool to see this. And yeah. then I have a hammer sitting in front of me, which is one of Thor's hammers, one of the original screen used hammers. This one happens to be from Dark World, which was made in uh, 2013. All of these hammers, and there's a number of them, are actually really heavy. Mm -hmm. Some of them they use to drop on pavement and actually break stuff. Hmm. And then some of them are lighter ones, but this happens to be one of the heavy ones. So this is one of his screen used hammers this little guy over here is a i have another head here from this is from a movie called gremlins and that's they, actually from gremlins well not only that that's the hero bad guy huh. that's strike with his mohawk yeah. haircut that's one of stripes original puppet heads from gremlins wow I, and i love that and then last but not least certainly is boris karloff's life cast and makeup is the monster from frankenstein that's also 1931 karloff was a a player who had made something like 80 movies before he got this break and yeah. played the monster and you know he didn't speak and people thought ah oh, you know is this going to be any big deal and of course it launched his career and he became the most famous face in the history of horror movies and there was another nice guy great guy uh -huh. I got to meet him like three times and each time he just was such a nice guy huh the furthest thing from a monster you could think I mean he was this British gentleman that was just such a great guy yeah and he liked kids and if you knew about his movies he would just talk to you about all it was really cool so that's some of the stuff I brought down here a cross-section of things from the 80s from the 30s from uh, the 90s and then the 2000s here so you have a lot of stuff here so so well, first of all thank you for bringing all this stuff in this happy is to do it. So I love showing cool. this stuff to people yes it is too cool so now you brought in about six or seven pieces, right? So mm -hmm. now how big is your entire collection, would you say? It's about 2,800, 2,900 pieces. 2,900 pieces. Mm -hmm. 
And so is most of this in your house or where do you store it? No, this? none of it's in the house. Really. None. Okay. No. Um, it's stored mostly in a warehouse in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. Why Columbus, Ohio? I have to have a partner there who makes these uh, pneumatic things that walk around and jump at people and like walking with dinosaurs and uh -huh. things like that. And he and I are going to start a science fiction, fantasy and horror hall of fame together. So really, he's got, yeah, he builds all these really cool things. And so he stores most of that stuff down there. And then I also have an exhibit right now on Hollywood Boulevard called Icons of Darkness. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, that's right down there on uh, Hollywood and Highland right now. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff in there. And people come in and they say, oh, my gosh, there's so much stuff. Look at all the stuff. And it's about 50% of it. Really. Oh, my. Yeah. So when did that open? That opened on the 27th of September. So we'd be open for Halloween. Right before Halloween. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And is it going to stay open? Well, it, it's good. that's what's going to move up. It's going to move next to the Chinese theater. And then become the Hall the of Fame. The Hall of Fame, yeah, like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, only except science fiction, fantasy, and horror movies. And when do you expect that to open up to the public? Probably, I'm hoping it'll open for summer. Okay. Summertime. Summer. When the tourist things really start going. So now this this is, it's obviously a, a, a pure passion of yours. Yep. Right? And I'm curious, like, when did this passion start? Well, I was always crazy about science fiction and horror movies. My favorite movie was King Kong, the 1933 yeah. one. When I saw that, I freaked out. I was probably in second or third grade, and I just figured, hey, these guys can transport me into this other world, and I gotta be in this business. Uh -huh. I ended up in comedy, not yeah. making horror movies, but still, it's really the thing that kind of was the catalyst to get me in the show business. I just loved that movie. But I always loved Halloween and scary stuff. My parents thought I was crazy. They weren't into any of that at all. Mm -hmm. But I always loved wax museums and heads and masks and everything. So when I was a kid, you know, I, I collected a few Halloween masks, whatever I could afford. Yeah. But then when I started working as an actor, and that's when I was eight years old, I started working as a professional actor. Okay. One of the shows that I got cast on as a regular was Leave It to Beaver. Huh. Now, you may be too young to remember. I know everybody remembers Leave It to Beaver. Yeah, right? you know, when you tell people you were in the original Leave It to Beaver cast, they go, how old is this guy? Because <laughs> that's a vintage TV show. But anyway, Jerry Mathers, who played Beav, he and I were great friends and we loved horror movies. And here we were at Universal where they made all these movies. Yeah. So we kept bugging our makeup man, you know. I was like, can you take us to the makeup lab? Take us to the makeup lab. Come on, come on. And you're like a nine-year-old kid at this oh, point. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nine, ten, something uh -huh. like that. So they finally took us up to the lab. And, of course, you know, we were in heaven. We saw all these life casts and heads from the movies. But the thing that we noticed, especially me, was they were throwing all this stuff in the trash. In those days, no one cared about preserving this old stuff. It just, you know, they made those things to be used in a movie, maybe good for two or three months, and yeah. then they would put it on a shelf and let the stuff deteriorate. I saw them throw the land suit from Creature from the Black Lagoon. Now, that's a 3D movie that Universal made in 1954. Mm -hmm. They threw that suit in the trash just because they just went, nah, it's taking up space and it's kind of beginning to fall apart. Today at auction, that's worth about a million six. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, they were doing this before of a thing called eBay, right? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, no, no one ever heard of any of that. But they threw that in the trash. If you fished it out of the trash, you would have been a millionaire. Of course. Just like that. But anyway, I saw a head in the trash from a movie called uh, Abbott and Costello Meet Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Okay. And it was like a Mr. Hyde head, a half mask, a foam half mask. Uh -huh. Karloff played Jekyll and Hyde. So I knew what it was. And I said to this guy, I don't know, some guy standing behind the counter. I said, hey, can I take that? It was a little kid. You know? Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's in the trash. You know, before someone threw coffee on it or something. Of course. And that's what started. I still have that, by the way. That was your first piece. That's the first piece. That's what started all the movie collecting. And, you know, as a kid, there wasn't much you could do. I was a very honest guy. I wasn't going to run through the makeup labs and take stuff. I mean, I can tell you stories about stuff that we saw uh -huh. that I wish I had had my hands on. Yeah, now, right? And, oh, just unbelievable. Uh -huh. But I started collecting and, you know, it just turned into this hobby and then it kind of got fun and then I showed more stuff to my friends and, oh, it's really cool and you have this. Then it became bigger and bigger and bigger. And then when I started to do more work and I could actually afford things, yeah. I started buying stuff from makeup effects guys and then auctions. These auction houses started auctioning all this stuff. So it's, it's really... It's really been fun. And it's also cool because there's a preservation aspect to it. Of course. Because a lot of this stuff would have been junked. And now somebody took it, and I have a whole crew of people that'll refurbish stuff for me and everything. Uh -huh. 
And so I'm preserving a lot of it. And I'm having a lot of fun doing it. And, you know, people come along and they see this stuff and they like freak out. Because, you know, people remember where they, where they were when they saw The Exorcist and, yeah. and they saw Batman and all that stuff. So I'm yeah. just having a blast doing it. It's, it's really cool. But I've been doing it for years and years and years now. So it's this huge collection of stuff, which all started kind of on a whim. You know, yeah. Just because I was a fan and I was a kid and I was at Universal and they were, I was, they were throwing stuff in the trash. Huh. Well, it's a, I mean, this is part of like our culture here, right? And I guess my question to you, though, is you've got so much of this, but none of this stuff could really be replaced, right? So like, how does that work? Like, do you insure this stuff? Like Everything's insured. It's insured. Yeah. 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 But, you know, it's funny, um, Jason, that it, with a lot of these movies, they make more than one piece. Do they? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. No <clears throat> they make more than one piece, and um, like Freddy Heads, they made nine Freddy movies. Then they made Freddy vs. Jason. Then they made a Freddy TV series. So things like Freddy gloves and and sweaters and hats. Mm -hmm. There were just so many of them yeah. that if you bought them when they first came out onto the auction market, they would be very very expensive. Yeah. And the more they stayed out, the less expensive they became. Um, same with Batman and things like that. I mean, you know, when, when Warner Brothers made the movie in 89, they made 11 of those suits. Hmm. You know, four of them were just for the stunt team. I so see. they made a whole bunch of these suits. Some were production made, some were screen used. But after a while, the more of them that circulate, the, the, it, I mean, a collection like this can appreciate or depreciate. It depends. It depends on what the current climate is and it depends on what people will pay for it I got at it. auction. Mm -hmm. So things change all the time. So when you said, how does that work? Um, I take stuff and restore it. And then those are my copies of the stuff and most of it's screen used. I see. But, but some of them, they're rare, but they're not the only ones. There's a couple of things. This is the only one. This only sledgehammer. Yep. But Thor hammers, there's probably, per each movie, there's probably seven or eight of them. And it probably puts the valuation of the originals much higher than the ones where there's multiple copies of them, right? Well, and, I mean, things that are screen used are always very expensive. Yeah. Things that are production made come next. Mm -hmm. That would be made by the production but didn't end up necessarily on camera. I see. And then there's replicas after that. And so there's, there's a whole business of selling replicas, too. Huh. So what would you say is like uh, one of the most fascinating uh, pieces that you got that you had to kind of go on a crazy bidding war for? Like something that was, well, the, you, you, you had to have it, right? It was like, you didn't care what it was going to cost. Like it was just a piece. When right? you don't care what it's going to cost and you're uh -huh. competing with people like Paul Allen. Okay. That can be a big problem. <laughs> a big problem. Because he, he was a big collector too. Yeah. I have the muzzle mask they take Lecter off the plane with in Silence of the Lambs. Okay. Um, I have uh -huh. the Queen Alien from Aliens. I have the original suit, the original alien suit from the first movie. Um, I, ha I mean, I've got a lot of, I mean, people ask me, I mean, I've got the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park. Mostly. Wow. The full okay. size ones. You do. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh -huh. pretty cool. And so people love to see that stuff. Like the T-Rex head where the, that comes down and tries to take the kids out of the car. And yeah. I've got that. It's on Hollywood Boulevard. Wow. You can see it down there. Uh -huh. So, <clears throat> I, I mean, there's things that I really, really wanted. Um, in most cases, the stuff I really wanted, I was able to get. I mean, right now, the only dinosaur that's ever been up for auction that I don't have is the Spitter from Jurassic Park. Okay. That was sold at a pretty good price, but I had I'd purchased so many of the dinosaurs, I was like running out of money. <laughs> I'm not Paul Allen. <laughs> so and I didn't get the Spitter, and then the Spitter came around in a couple more auctions for almost double yeah. what they sold it for. So I wasn't going to pay that kind of price. So who's selling these things? Is it the actual movie production companies? Or? Well, it, like in the case of the dinosaurs, that stuff was built by Stan Winston yeah. in the Stan Winston company. Uh -huh. Then he had a seven-year license to be able to hold on to it. And then they were allowed to sell his personal copies of the stuff, even though they were screen used. I see. And then they went into what's called a public forum, which is an auction, which makes everything you buy legal. Yeah. So if you buy something at an auction, then you can display it to the public for money if it's sold at an auction because it's a public forum. Yeah. So that's all universal property, but it's still, it was the property, personal property of Stan Winston, and then it was sold in a public forum at, at an auction. So now that's my personal property now. Interesting. Yeah, I that's see. how that works. Now, how many collectors are there that's kind of at your level, would you say? Is there like uh, five people that, you know, come to mind that are kind of have a big collection like you? Yeah. <coughs> 
Excuse me. Yeah, we all know each other. Yeah, that's what I figured, right? You guys. Yeah, are... there's five or six of them. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Five or six of them, and then there's a lot more people that collect, but not at the same level. And then there's people who just collect Jaws, just collect Harry Potter, just collect Aliens. You know, it's that kind of thing, too. And is any of your pieces ever for sale? No. I've never traded or sold a piece in 55 years. Interesting. Not once. Not, so, no, anything that goes to me, and this is one of the reasons I think the effects guys liked me is because they knew their stuff wasn't going to end up on eBay or something. Huh. Do museums contact you? All or, the time. I'd imagine, right? The, the new Academy Museum, my wife and I are benefactors of that. Uh -huh. So we were there from the beginning, and they, I mean, actually donated Harold Lloyd's makeup kit. Harold Lloyd was a very, very famous silent movie yeah, comedian, uh -huh. but that's, again, all comedy. Uh -huh. They came over to the house, <laughs> to pick up the makeup kit and they saw some of this stuff and they said what we're, you know what is this you know uh -huh. we have a theater and there was like 27 effects heads in there <laughs> and they, i said oh this is other the other stuff i collect and they said oh well would you donate that and i went no <laughs> no 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 I, i've got other plans for it because i'm gonna do my own but i like the academy and we work with them mm -hmm. um there's that's the only other museum that i know of it's you know what's really strange is in the history of the movies and that history started around 1895. Yeah. That's when movies were kind of like invented and people thought they were some novelty. By 1903, 1904, people were going to Nickelodeons. Yeah. In the history of the movies, the single most successful continuing genre has always been science fiction and horror. Mm -hmm. It's never not made money. It's never gone out of style. It's always been this mainstay for the business. And nobody has ever paid tribute to any of that stuff. Nobody. No one's ever had this size of collection and no one's ever had like a hall of fame or a place to pay tribute to these movies yeah so that's what i'm trying to do ah, i'm I trying see. to build this place that does that what 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 satisfies you? you you you've invested a lot of time money resources to building this collection like like does it really kind of like make you feel whole if somebody goes to hollywood boulevard walks in and is like blown away by one of your pieces is that kind of what drives you or what yeah, I mean, I think I think that's really fun if you can share it. Yeah, you know, you like to share your passion with other people. Uh huh. So I think that's really fun. Yeah. Um. And again, I like it when people go, "Oh my gosh, I remember where I was when I saw this, and this is great." But then there's people who come to it, like for instance, Stan Winston passed away, you know, 13 years ago. Yeah. And his son is a good friend of mine. Huh. And his son came in to see this exhibit. And it actually made him misty oh, because wow. it was a tribute to his dad. Yeah. There was so much Stan Winston stuff. There it is. And that means something, too. The mm -hmm. preservation aspect of it and the fact that, you know, I believe that Hollywood should be tr paying tribute to my favorite genre of stuff. Mm -hmm. I want to be part of that. You're preserving history. Yeah. So I, that, I really like that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's part of it that's really fulfilling. No, I, I, I love that. So... So it's, it's interesting. So I lived in, I grew up in New York, Yep. right? And then we moved to uh, LA as a family. We didn't, I didn't, my family wasn't raised in New York. We moved all over the place. We what year in Atlanta? In LA? What year? What year were we in Atlanta? No, L LA. In LA, we moved here in 2015. Oh, okay? so right? you're kind of newbies. We're, we're kind of really, really new, right? Got it. And so where we ended up stationing ourselves was in Toluca Lake, yep. right? And because my son was getting into acting and he was training down the road over on Riverside Drive there. Um, and then Halloween came. And you know as well as I do what Halloween means if you're in Toluca Lake. <laughs> I was in Toluca Lake in 1969, 70, 71, 72, and 73. And we put on one of the biggest Halloween shows you could imagine. Right really? on the corner of Toluca Lake Avenue and Mariota. Interesting. And we yeah. did a thing on a guy's roof huh. where we did a whole stage show. But yeah. it was very, very elaborate. Halloween, to me, has always been the best day of the year. And I now, at our house, mm -hmm. it's this really famous, we have like 8,000 people show up. Wow. Yeah, yeah. we do. The, I mean, it's crazy. The whole place is decorated from the roof to every window <laughs> to stuff in the French doors. <laughs> and we actually designed the front of my house for Halloween. Do you? Well, yeah. that's that's what I'm saying. So, like, when I went, we went trick or treating, not realizing like what this is like. And so we went to this area called Toluca Lake Estates, where they like literally close it down, and there's thousands of people yeah, just walking it's so around, cool. right? 
And I'm just like, what is happening right now? Like people go out, they got boats. So I'd imagine like that's kind of what you've been living here. Well, as I said, yeah. we used to do it in uh -huh. Toluca Lake. You yeah. Know? I mean, Toluca Lake was a huge Halloween deal. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we've been living. We've been like, it's, uh, it's such a big deal that, the, and, and by the way, what's funny is some of the neighbors, they love it. Uh -huh. And then some of the neighbors are like, uh oh, not, not this guy again. No, we're not going to do this again, are we? Because their tree lawns get trampled and everything uh -huh. else. You know? yeah. yeah. It's just been, it's really cool. Toluca Lake's the best. That's a great place. To it be. is the best, mm -hmm. right? And I think, uh, you know, LA is probably one of the few places where you have Halloween stores, like in Burbank, that's open like all year round, too. Yeah, right? that's, well, yeah, uh -huh. the, the, the uh, Halloween town. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, friends of mine run that place. Do they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Of course. Of you know, course, yeah. yeah, but you're right. Yeah, there's places that are all year round. They have Halloween, so it's cool. And I want to talk about your Halloween parties, but before I do that, I want to go back, right? So was Halloween your always your favorite holiday? Yeah. As a, oh, even oh, as a sure. kid? Yeah. yeah. And as I said, my parents couldn't figure it out. Yeah, huh? There was something about the orange and black and the pumpkins and candles. I don't know what it was. It's our family's favorite holiday, too. Yeah, like my whole family. My son. If you talk huge. to a lot of people over the years, you're going to find out it's a lot of people's favorite holiday. Yeah, uh-huh. But people like to get dressed up and be somebody else that's right month. yeah yeah it's, kind of, it's really cool so so growing you grew up in in hollywood i did okay and uh what was that like mom and dad tell me a little bit more well my father and his partner were the two most successful radio comedians in history okay they were the biggest stars in the world they had a show called amos and andy okay my father was andy huh now today this is a big taboo because it was two white guys playing black guys okay they started on the air with Amos Nandy in 1928, and they were on until 1961. So for 33 years, they had the number one radio show in the country. Wow. So we lived in this neighborhood in a place called Homeby Hills, and we had this large estate, a lot of property. My father, by the way, was an extremely humble, kind, really nice guy. Yeah. He should have been my grandfather, because when I was born, he was 58. Okay. So I kind of never knew him as a really young guy. Yeah. But anyway, we lived in this house, and around us, all of these neighbors, I mean, if you if you were a younger guy, you'd probably know a lot of them, but it was Alan Ladd, Lana Turner, okay. Judy Garland, yeah. Humphrey Bogart, and Lauren Bacall. In the neighborhood. These were our direct neighbors. <laughs> like, if wow. you climb the fence, this is whose house we go into. <laughs> then there was Jerry Lewis, Carol Burnett, Walt Disney, who we spent a lot of time with. Is that right? When I was a kid, I spent a lot of time with him, yeah. Really? Yeah, and then the people who founded the Bank of America. Those, okay. were, those were our neighbors. Huh. And is so, this just where in in Beverly Hills? Yeah, or? this was the, our house was about seven doors away, but doors meaning this was big property yeah. from the Playboy Magic. Ah, mm -hmm. Bel Air. No, it was be, it, Homeby Hills was between Beverly Hills and Bel Air. I see. I it's, got it's, it. a, it's still part of the LA. It's part. It's an LA community, but it's not Beverly Hills. I got it. I and it's see. before. It's just before you get to Bel Air. And interesting. And we lived on Sunset Boulevard. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what was that? What was that like, right? Because now, you know, you see all these people on TV, as does all of America, right? But then you get to hang out with them out of character as individuals. What was that like? It was a blast. I mean, you know, I just finished a book about my life. Did you? I hope people are interested. I don't know. I am. But but the thing is about it, Jason. I was super lucky. Yeah. I was lucky to be brought up where I was brought up. I was be, I was lucky to have parents who were entrenched in Hollywood who were normal people. Yeah. And then the people around us and the people we grew up with, my brother and sisters and I, I think we, we I mean, we knew who they were, but we appreciated who they were, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you had, you know, if you had dinner with Fred Astaire or Bob Hope or, you know, you were sitting down with, I mean, I went to, I was playing football on Judy Garland's back lawn okay. with Johnny Luff, that was her stepson. Uh, she, this is when she was married to Sid Luft and we went into the kitchen and of course, everyone, you never called her Judy. She was Mrs. Luft. I mean, everybody had to be very polite. <laughs> That's the way we were raised. But she was making soup and she was just in the kitchen. So Johnny and I went in there and got ourselves some cookies or something we were eating. He got up to go do something. I don't know what he was doing. So I was down there with just Judy. And I said to her, you know, Mrs. Luft, I saw your movie last night because The Wizard of Oz had just been on TV. Yeah. By the way, the first like four times I ever saw it, I thought it was a black and white movie because nobody had color TV. Uh, I see. Nobody saw it in color. Uh huh. Anyway, I, I said, I saw your movie and she said, oh, that's fine, honey. You know, I was a little kid. Yeah. And I said, hey, will you sing that song for me? Over wow. the rainbow. 
And while she was making soup and I was eating cookies in her kitchen, she sang Over the Rainbow for me. That's... Now, if you tell that to people, they even think you're out of your mind. Yeah, or a or, dream. It sounds like a dream, right? Or, yeah, or yeah. you're making it up or uh -huh. something. But this is, this is the kind of stuff that would happen all the time. Huh. I mean, Walt Disney, we used to go to his house and ride this thing called the Carrollwood Express. He lived on a street called Carrollwood. Okay. And it was a miniature steam train his house was five acres and he built this train that went around his whole property and went over gorges and had bridges and all this stuff and it's kids and it was all in miniature but it was a real steam train and he was the conductor huh. he'd come and say are you guys having fun and let's go on a ride he you know he's like a big kid himself of course we would do that all the time and then when he cut the ribbon for disneyland my sister and i were like 10 feet away from him because he had he had invited our family down to go with him yeah. The opening of Disneyland. Huh. I've been there on a number of occasions. So before. how old were you when Disneyland opened then? Uh, six. You are six years old. And yeah. you remember that? I remember it really well. Huh. Yeah, and I also remember that it was 105. And, of course. And everybody was, the longest line in the park was the Carnation Pavilion, so people could get something to drink. And yeah. Yeah, I remember all that stuff. The, I remember the Jungle Cruise. I mean, it's the same. It's It was the same as it was 60 years ago. You yeah. Know? Uh -huh. So I remember a lot of the stuff. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, and we had a great time with him. I set up as a kid when I was like 10 or 12 years old, I set up a thing in the basement of our house, which was, again, it was a Frankenstein. I mean, I took my dad's clothes and, and stuffed them with newspapers and put some cheap mask on it and made, yeah. it, made it like a Frankenstein lab. And on Sundays, we, dad would have these big parties, like bar, he would barbecue chicken in the afternoons. People would go swimming and then they had these barbecues. Mm -hmm. And I asked... Ozzie Nelson, uh -huh. you know, from Ozzie and Harriet, yeah. Ricky Nelson's dad. And I asked him and Walt Disney if they would come into the basement and look at this thing I set up. And of course, my mom was like horrified. <laughs> oh my God, you can't invite people into our basement. Are you out of your mind? You know, it's like, so I did it anyway. And I took them down there and showed them this thing. And Walt Disney said to me, you know, you have a little too much orange in one area and not enough light on this monster. So let me help you. Ozzy had gone upstairs and here I was in the basement of my house with this thing I had set up and Walt Disney and I were switching out all the lights to what get a better heck? look at it. It's like, uh, yeah, you, how, how lucky is that? I mean, I told you I was like really lucky. So this was, that was really cool. I mean, so you said, how was it growing up with all of it? Uh -huh. I think we appreciated, but we had a lot of fun. Sure. And we were lucky, like really lucky to be yeah. able to meet those people and do those things. And Well, you probably hung out with a lot of their children yeah. and then became friends with all of them. Bloomingdale, right? you know, Al Bloomingdale lived across the street and okay. I was good friends with Jeff. He was my age and, you know, the, the, all the Harmons, Kelly Harmon, Mark Harmon, all of those guys are really close friends of ours. And, sure. Yeah. And like I said, the Luffs were friends, uh -huh. the Bogarts were friends. Wow. Yeah, we just we knew everybody. Yeah, I, and my father, like my father had his own table at Chasen's, this famous, famous restaurant. Yeah. And the table was between, we'd go in on Sundays, and it was between Lucille Ball and Jimmy Stewart. Huh. So we would come in to have like dinner, and that's who's like sitting there talking to you. But for you, it's just normal life. It was a normal life. Just normal life. Yeah, everybody, we had to be, my mom was, our family was Catholic. Okay. So my mom was like a professional Catholic. Okay. So we were always we went to Catholic schools. I went to, the first non-Catholic school I went to was USC. I went to college. Oh, you did. And that <laughs> was like the, not a Catholic school, but everything else was Catholic. So everybody had to be really polite, and everybody uh -huh. had to be, you know, dressed nicely. And you had to, you know, you, if you went out to dinner, you, it was everything was in a suit and tie. And uh -huh. I can remember when they used to sell loges tickets in theaters, and we had if we went with our parents, like to some like the Ten Commandments or something. We had to wear a suit and tie to go to the movies. Yeah. Huh. So it was a whole different time, and but it was a lot of fun. It was it, it was a lot of fun. It, it sounds sure like it, man. It was I a wish blast. I wish I was a fly on the wall for some of these stories that you're sharing here. So cool. So then, um, so now you kind of get out of adolescence and now you become a teenager, right? Mm -hmm. And so what was life like as a teenager for you? Life was great as a teenager. I always had fun. I, again, I was at the Catholic schools. I went to yeah. Loyola, uh -huh. which was an all male school. Yeah. Uh -huh. So anytime we could be around the Catholic high school girls or anybody else, this was like a lot of fun. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great, great time. Um, but I stayed. You know, I always was directing shows or directing my own stuff. Or so you, as a teenager, you kind of was already kind of knew what you wanted when to do. When I was nine or ten years old, yeah, um, I knew what I wanted to do. You did, yeah. And then when I started acting, 
And it was, was it was in front of the camera or behind the camera? When I started acting, I yeah. was much more interested in what was going on behind the behind camera. Behind the camera, okay. You know? And I didn't say, oh, I want to be a director so I can direct everybody, but I was always fascinated by the directors because they had their hands in everything. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I liked that. I, I liked that responsibility, and I liked doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I thought that was really fun. Um, and so as a teenager, um, I was still having a great time. Uh, my first girlfriend was Ricardo Montalban's daughter. <laughs> okay. It was and it, Anita Montalban, and the mm -hmm. Montalban family was the best, and he was such a sweet, nice guy. Yeah. All of these guys, most of these movie stars, if you knew them away from the set or whatever, they were great people. Yeah. And as I said, the villains, like Vincent Price is one of the nice, or was one of the nicest people ever. Uh -huh. you know, if you got to meet these people away from the sets, yeah. they were the best. Huh. So th we had a great time. So I was dating, and having fun and you know and then I got into USC and that was all cinema arts that was a cinema arts major and I went to I sat in class with George Lucas and John Carpenter they went to the same school as you yeah but I mean, nobody knew you know that George Lucas would be who who sure. he turned out to be huh. he gave me a ride in his Porsche I had a I was driving like a stock not very expensive like a Chevy 396 yeah and he said, oh, this is a muscle car, he said to me. Well, you, know, you know, I bought it. No, it wasn't a muscle car. Yeah, yeah. He loved cars. He didn't talk about science fiction. No, huh? And he had this kind of like secondhand Porsche. Yeah. And he said, I'm going to take you on a ride around the campus. Or not the campus, around the outside. Of the sure, campus, Down sure. in Hoover. Uh -huh. And that's like the fastest I ever went in a passenger car. This guy was crazed. Huh. He just loved speeding and cars and chases. But he, no one said anything about science fiction and star wars and all no yeah no one thought of anything like that hmm. and by the way he was just like another student there wow man fascinating yeah so really cool so uh so you then graduated usc okay mm -hmm. yep. and then what happened like how did you kind of make your debut into the directing world well while i was still a teenager i met harold lloyd okay who had been in business with my dad in 1940 Yep. They started a radio station called KMPC. Okay. And so Lloyd, you know, I didn't know too much about him because his films had been vaulted for so many years. And I was able to see some of his films in the early 60s, and I just loved them. So I met Harold Lloyd, and I actually I dated his granddaughter for like seven years. Interesting. I had the key to like every door in his house. And it was <laughs> and that place was Xanadu. It was like 17 and a half acres behind the Beverly Hills Hotel. Mm -hmm. But anyway... This guy was one of the nicest people in the world. And so what happened was I started taking care of his nitrate film collection and getting everything transferred from nitrate to safety film. Now nitrate 35 millimeters is what they made all the old movies on. But that's a really volatile stock that shrinks, it deteriorates, and it also is really flammable. Mm -hmm. So you want to save all of that stuff. Sure. So um, I started working for him and I got, I was, I, that, allowed me to become hands-on with 35 millimeter film. Okay. So I knew about printers and projectors and soundtracks and emulsion types, negatives, positives, all that stuff. You're getting real world experience even before you said I've got on the job experience yeah. being really lucky to have worked for Harold Lloyd. And because yeah. we, first of all, we were preserving a very, very important American film collection. Mm -hmm. And second of all, it gave me all of this hands-on experience with labs and film and everything. Yeah. So when I got out of college, the first thing I did was I went back to work at the Lloyd Estate because Harold died just about the time I was graduating. Okay. And then we opened his house as a museum. I wrote the tours. But then I went to Time Life Films because Time Life Films had bought his catalog. I see. And I started doing more editing and dubbing and all this stuff. So I had a really good 35 post-production uh, background. Mm. And from there... I got a job with a guy named Nick Vanoff. Nick Vanoff had a company out of Beverly Hills, and he produced the Sonny and Cher show, the Hollywood Palace, and Hee Haw. Yeah, huh. So <laughs> that was interesting. Hee Haw yeah. was shot in Nashville, but it was posted in L.A. The Sonny and Cher show was really interesting. That was down at CBS. And this was all post on tape. So I was like an associate producer for him. From there, I went to 20th Century Fox and worked on a show called That's Hollywood. Okay. which was produced by the guy that made That's Entertainment, Jack Haley Jr. And again, it was about being an archivist, film history, putting together clips of shows. And from there, a friend of mine who I knew really well had been over working with Gary Marshall as a music coordinator at Paramount on Gary shows. Sure. And they were moving him up to become the associate producer of Mork and Mindy. Oh, and wow. he just called me and said, do you want to come to Paramount 
and do this job as Gary a music Coulter? coordinator. No, well, yeah, for Gary Marshall. Uh. And I said, are you kidding? <laughs> I was like in the right place at the right time. So I went over to Paramount. I started working as a music coordinator. They started to realize, Gary Marshall and his family, who ran, I mean, they had The Odd Couple, Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, and Mork and Mindy. I mean, they were hot, hot. Yeah. Like, white hot. Sure. They began to realize that I was a guy with a post experience. And in those days, everything was shot on film and posted on film. Huh. Everything. It was all 35 millimeter. And a, a woman named Ronnie Hallen, that Ronnie Hallen Marshall, that's Gary's older sister, not Penny. Okay. She took a liking to me and said, you know, we want you to go down and dub a couple of the shows. I've been there for like six months doing this music coordinating thing because I was a, I, I play guitar and drums and, oh, interesting. you know, I have a musical background. <clears throat> and that was a blast. That was so cool working with all the musicians and sideliners and unions and all that. Yeah. But they said, go down and dub some of these shows because we're looking for someone to fill in, take over as associate producer of Laverne and Shirley. Now, Laverne and Shirley was the number two show in the country. I remember it. It was yeah. like, really? So again, they liked my work. Ronnie Hallen advanced me. I became associate producer of Laverne and Shirley. That led to becoming associate producer and then kind of like the line producer of Happy Days. I met a guy named Fred Fox Jr. who was one of the writers. Okay. He and I started writing together. I wrote a number of Happy Day shows. I ended up being one of the writers up at the tables. Huh. So, And I worked for Gary for like seven and a half years. I mean, Robin Williams used to come in. I had a, but my first office at Paramount, I swear to God this is true, okay. it was like a broom closet. Every they, story he tells is like, it gets just so much better. <laughs> and Robin Williams, when he uh -huh. was just starting, I yeah. mean, not even a lot of people know who he was, used to come up. He, I think he felt sorry for me. I was in this closet. I had a little desk. <laughs> and to get to the desk, he had to kind of climb over stuff. But I had all of these photographs of vintage comedians that had worked at Paramount. Yeah. And used to come in and sit down, just hang out. Uh -huh. Talk to me about the, the guys on the wall and... You know, the Ames and Andy radio and TV shows sure. and all this stuff. Because he was, fan and Robin was the best. He was so sweet. Oh, yeah. Great guy. Uh -huh. So, again, that was just totally lucky. And so from there, I started producing. I stayed with Gary for seven years. And then one of his partners was a guy named Tom Miller. Okay. It was Miller, Milkus, uh, Marshall did the Happy Day shows and all that. And Tom Miller formed a partnership with a guy named Bob Boyette. It was Miller Boyette. Miller Boyette left Paramount, went to Lorimar. They took me with them yeah. as like a line producer. Uh -huh. The first show we ever did was called Valerie, which was the Valerie Harper show, which became the Hogan family. Yeah. And while we were doing the Hogan family, which I was producing, um, they asked me, there was an opening for a director, and they said, do you want to direct? And Tom and Bob were the best, the yeah. most loyal guys in the business. And they said, do you want to direct? And you know, I, was, I wasn't shy. Huh. I'd been around the directing and all the editing, and I, I mean, I knew the ins and outs of it. I said, sure. I've been an actor. Yeah. You know? So I started directing, and then for a number of years, I was directing and producing. That was really fun, and then that became exclusively directing, and then, you know, I, I had... I had a party for my 500th episode, and then I've directed a party for my 700th episode. Oh my God! So I've 700. done 719 episodes. Do you remember the first time you got asked to be the director? Like, was that stressful? It's like you you are the now the man, right? Well, I mean, there's a it's there. See, the thing that was really lucky, Jason, is the shows that I started directing had been shows that I was producing. Oh, so you already had. Well, I the got cast. It. If the cast likes you, and everybody, most of those people were really friendly. Yeah. You know, Valerie Harper was great. Sandy Duncan was great. Jason Bateman was great. They were all great. They were yeah. really nice people. If they like you and you're coming in to do their show, the, everybody wants you to do well. Sure, sure, So you sure. find that most of these people are on their best behavior. They I didn't, got it. No one was copying attitudes and all this other stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so we just had a great time, and, and it went well. Yeah. I do lots of homework. I'm really prepped. Of course. Yeah. Gary appreciated that. Tom and Bob appreciated that. The studio appreciated that. Yeah. So, right. you know, I was... Um, and so did the audience that was watching it. And right? I love... Yeah. I did so many live, like, in front of audience shows. That was so much fun. Did you? To do these live shows. Oh, yeah, it's a blast. Uh -huh. And the sitcoms we did, a lot of people think a lot of that's canned laughter. Uh-uh. No. No, 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 no. We did a lot of stuff that was, like, really... As a matter of fact, in the case of Fonzie, 
when Henry was hot, and it was a time when he was the number one star on, on television. Period, yeah, yeah, yeah. He'd come in to the scene, like walk into Arnold's. Mm -hmm. People would give him an ovation that was so long, we would have to cut half of it. <laughs> so it's not only that were we not using canned stuff, we yeah. actually were cutting it's, it's some of the stuff that was real. So my happy day story is, so uh, my son goes to school, and one day um, he's hanging out with a girl, um, and uh, I get a knock on the door, and um, a woman shows up at my door, and she's like, hey, how are you? I hear your son's an actor. I'm here to pick up my daughter, Roxy. I'm like, oh, cool. Well, nice to meet you. She's like, yeah, I, I used to be an actress, too. I'm like, really? What were you in? She said, Happy Days. I'm like, Happy Days? Really? She's like, have you heard of it? I'm like, who hasn't heard of Happy Days? Yeah. So it turns out that she was Jenny Piccolo, Kathy Silvers. Oh, Kathy Silvers was yes. awesome. Yeah. Uh-huh. I saw her every single day. Did you? Well, yeah. of course, I loved her dad. Phil Silvers. Yeah. Oh, my right? gosh. I uh -huh. mean, the best. But Kathy was always super nice. Yeah. Really organized. You know, it's funny. She had a character that Fonzie picked on a uh, lot. Uh -huh. I don't know if they could get away with as much. I mean, he really picked on her. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, not in real life. I mean, Henry and Kathy were friends. Sure. But Kathy played a really good character that was kind of a foil for Fonzie. And then she was the opposite. She was supposed to be one of Joni's friends. And of course, Joni was this sugar and spice and everything nice uh -huh. character. And Kathy was just the opposite. <laughs> she was kind of the Eddie Haskell of, uh, of Joni's friends. That's yeah, right. Yeah, Kathy was super nice. Yeah. I liked her a lot. That's, so that was, uh, that was really uh, fun. But um, yeah, just you never know when Happy Day stars are going to knock on your door, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Only in, in L.A. Um, so you've got so many different, uh, you know, shows that you've participated in. Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, Full House, Family Matters. Um, what did you work on in the 80s? What were some of the other shows? You got Family Matters, Married with Children. Was that one of them? Yeah, the, yeah. I did Married with Children. Um, I did Reba, okay. Yes, Dear. Um, I mean, I, was, I would go from sitcom to sitcom to sitcom. Yeah. yeah and even most, some mostly family programming. Okay. Mostly stuff that family, like the TGIF yep. block. Uh -huh. that they created in the early 90s. Yeah. I was like ABC's most prolific director of those shows. I see. I, I, I did a thing once where I had, I was one of the only directors in the history of the Directors Guild that had three shows on same night, same network, back to back. Wow. Yeah, which was a fluke. Uh -huh. Again, lucky. Yeah. yeah. But that was cool. Okay. So, I mean, I was always in production doing all this stuff and... I just, you know, I was lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. I mean, I worked hard, but I worked for really nice people. Sure. Especially people who would advance you if you did good work. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. I mean, that was really important. Well, it's funny because, like, you directed shows that my parents watched. Mm -hmm. You've directed shows that I've watched. And then you've even directed shows that my kids watch, right? Well, I don't want to tell you how many years I've been. <laughs> how many years. That's the problem is people go, wait, 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 wait. How long ago did you start doing this? That's a Raven, Sweet Life of Zach and Cody, Hannah Montana, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so Hannah Montana. So you worked with Miley. Yeah. Well, I created. I was the co-creator of Hannah Montana. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Huh. That was my show. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I worked with Miley, and uh, Miley's still like a completely sweet, really nice person. All the stuff about Miley in the last 10 years where like people thought, oh, she's losing her mind or she's doing all the no. twerking or she's doing this or uh -huh. she's, what's the matter with her? And she's, no, it's all calculated. It is. Because she did an extremely smart thing, which was she was, you know, Disney's biggest star, which has an up and, and a big downside to it. Yeah. And as soon as she got released from the show, she decided to get out from under the Disney thumb. Yeah. And so she did all of these things that were opposite anything Hannah Montana would Interesting. do. And it worked. Yeah. But Miley is a sweetheart. If you saw her, or she was walking by, I'd say, Miley, come on in. She'd sit and hang with us. And, is that right? Oh, she's a sweetheart. And huh. her dad, yeah. Billy Ray, yeah. he's the nicest guy. The only time I was ever late to be on stage when I was supposed to be back from lunch is because <clears throat> he kind of cornered me took me and put me in his car and played his new album for me. And I just couldn't, Is he said, right? no, no, you wait, you have to hear the next song. But only because he was a super nice guy. Huh? Billy is a super, super nice guy. So, so, so was that show written for Miley or did you cast for that? No, it wasn't written for Miley. It wasn't. No, the idea of Hannah Montana was a, a young girl who's kind of this unbelievably huge rock star kind of by night yeah. and by day, a high school student and nobody knew her identity. Yeah. So it was the, you know, the 
the epitome of the high school girls fantasy. That's okay. how the movie, that's how the show was sold. And so we didn't, there was, I wasn't involved in the early casting of it so much, but they looked at 300 girls. Emily Osment, who ended up playing Lily, actually was the forerunner, but they couldn't find a, a person to play Hannah. I and what that. happened was they had the Sprouse twins, Dylan and Cole Sprouse, who were Zach and Cody, and a, and a pair of, a, a group of triplet girls under contract. And Disney, I don't want to say nasty things about Disney, but they're a company that's not going to spend one dime unless they get something for it. I see. And the, the year of the pilot of Hannah Montana, they shelved the pilot, and they did a pilot called Triple Play with the three girls, and they did Sweet Life of Zach and Cody, and that's the one that sold. But when they shelved the pilot, it was for two reasons. They had other kids under contract that they had to use, mm -hmm. and they couldn't find the girl. They looked and looked and looked and couldn't find the girl. Miley came in and read. She was like 12 years old, very scrawny, not a great actress, pretty good singer. Yeah. But it was like, okay, somebody else, let's see, let's see some more people. And we thought, that's the end of that. Yeah. You know, we had written the pilot, the first and second draft of it. I and a guy named Barry O'Brien. Okay. Uh, and Barry I knew from the Miller Boyette days. But we thought, okay, well, that's the end of it. And then it came back a year later, and they said, we're going to do it. We're still going to do Hannah Montana. And then they went looking for people again. And Miley came in again. She was more mature. She looked a little better. Her acting So it's a couple pretty, years later now. Yeah, huh? but the thing is, one of the strange things that happened was, just on a whim, Billy Ray came in and read with her as her father. And she was more comfortable and seemed at ease. And everyone said, why don't we just hire him? So much chemistry. Not only that, hire him as the father because we'll get the country western yeah. people to watch. Uh huh. So he was as much of it as she was. Of course. And then, it, you know, she needed some help with acting. and she, But she was really appealing. The reason that Hannah Montana took off is because Miley took off. Oh, yeah. I mean, period. Perfect person to cast for that. Yeah, role. I mean, it's like Happy Days. I mean, uh -huh. Happy Days was a monster, monster hit because Henry was Fonzie. He was. You know? yeah. And Mork and Mindy, Mork and Mindy had been on the air for three shows, and it was the number one show in the country. In th and no pilot. They always made pilots of things. Is that but, right? But Robin had been on Happy Days, and they saw him on the Happy Days. He literally took over. Uh -huh. and, Just and one episode, and that's it. One Who episode. Is this guy, so right? they made no pilot. But yeah. that show became number one in three weeks. And that's, and Mork was because of Robin, Happy Days was because of Henry, and Ma Hannah Montana was because of Miley. Huh. Same, I saw it happen at least three times. Oh, and Family Matters, which was on the verge of being canceled, it was, it was show number 13, yeah. Unlucky 13, where Urkel showed up as a day player. Huh. And we, I was directing that show, and I went to the producers and said, this kid's really funny, you hired him, obviously you know that, but why don't we turn him into the, like a physical wreck? Every place he goes, he breaks things and wrecks <laughs> things. And they said to me, okay, well, the first scene he's in is a cafeteria. And I went, that's all I want to know. So watch, that was just on a this. limb, that was just total, on a total limb. Total whim. Huh. And I went to him, I went to Jaleel White, who was 13, mm -hmm. and I said, we're gonna turn you into a 13-year-old Jerry Lewis. And he went, who? <laughs> He had no idea who I was talking about. So that was, see, so, you know, Family Matters was because of Urkel. Yes. And the funny thing is Full House had a cast that everybody knew. Uh -huh. The girls loved Stamos. They thought the Coulier and Saget were really, really funny. Yep. But it was, it was the Olsen twins, the twins yeah. that got the high ratings because kids tuned in to see what Baby That's Michelle right. was doing. Yep. That so was the in, audience. In yep. the case of those being there for those shows, I was standing next to Jeff Franklin, Bob Boyette, when they cast Full House, they cast the kids. They brought in five sets of twin girls. We always had to have twins mm -hmm. because when you had a little baby in Can the show. Can only be on set so long, right? No, well, mm -hmm. if one goes down and it's crying, or something, they bring the other one in. I see. So there's always twins. Yeah. They put five sets of twins out in front of Bob Boyette, and he literally looked at these kids. One of them was asleep, Mary-Kate. Olsen was asleep uh -huh. in her little chair. Yeah. They were only like 10 months old. Sure. And he went, uh, let's see, I'll take, uh, and his finger was going back, he went, uh, them. And it's just- It was the hand of God. It was like, <laughs> and now they're billionaires. Yeah. I mean, they were, they, who knew? I mean, it was just completely lucky. And I was glad to be there. I was there when that happened. I mean, that was lucky for me too, but you never know. No. You huh? never, I mean, Henry Winkler, you know, 
I mean, who would think that he would play like the biggest hood on TV? Yeah, right? In, in real life, he's the furthest thing from that in the world. Uh -huh. Jaleel White, he's not a nerd. He, you should have seen him play basketball. Sure. He was like an NBA basketball player. Wow. So, mm -hmm. I mean, who, whoever knows how these things happen. But those shows that take off like that need a catalyst. Yeah. And so it was Robin, it was Henry, it was Cindy Williams and Penny. Mm -hmm. It was Julia White. That's the, And it was Miley. Sure. And it was Raven. Raven was huge because she was such a talented person by herself. Yeah. That's how those shows take off. Huh. Yep. It's so interesting how there's a little bit of uh, luck that's played oh, into man. this. There's a lot of talent. A lot of luck. There's a lot of talent. Don't get me wrong, but there's also a whole lot of luck being Every, at the right place. Everything's about luck. Yeah. Being at the right place at the right time in front of the right people, right? And that goes for everybody on the stage. Yeah. Not just the actors. Everybody's got to be in the right place at the right time. So my, uh, my son uh, came out here. We moved out here so he can try to pursue this acting thing, too. Um, and... Uh, you know, my son, I wanted to help him pursue his young dreams, right? And so we moved out here. Um, and, you know, he hasn't really landed any breakout roles, right? But he continues to show up. But nowadays, like you said, um, uh, you know, he's competing against, like, kids that have 10 million followers on Instagram, on social media. And a lot of times they're getting cast just so that you can bring the audience. From, yeah, that's a whole right? different factor. When nowadays, I was a kid right? and, and even directing stuff, up, that wasn't... That was non-existent. No, huh? The thing to tell him is, you got to have thick skin in Hollywood. Yep. Mm -hmm. You can't take rejection personally. No. Because mm -hmm. it just isn't, I mean, from the beginning of the movie and TV business, you just can't take rejection personally. That's it. You might be too big, too tall, too skinny, yep. too you know, funny looking, too handsome. But it might be whatever. the perfect person. Or the perfect person. Yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So tell him... Keep at it, but don't get discouraged. Just have thick skin. And he's still 17, so he's competing with 22-year-olds that are playing 17-year-olds. Yeah, right? but so. 17 is a great age. Is it? Man, when you're 17, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. you should have uh, you know a lot of gumption and uh, yeah, a lot of fight, and just tell him not to. 17 is the best. And he's compete like he's auditioned, got far with Stranger Things, like shows that are big hits, but just never got no, his no, big no, break no. yet. No, 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 Tell him not yeah. to give up. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If he's 17 years old, he's got a long ways to go, but he'll be fine. Okay. Is yeah. he a good actor? He is. Yeah. Then tell him to keep at it and not to worry about it. He, he has is. an agent? He does. Does he like his agent? Yeah. Okay, uh -huh. he's a very rare person because most people don't like their agents. Yeah. No, he was signed with Coast to Coast. Big, big. So agent. they send him out on a lot of stuff? Yeah. Then he's in great shape. He is, he's, yeah. He's way ahead of the game. Got a great manager. Um, Sharon Lane is his manager. I don't know if you know Sharon. No, but, but that's yeah. okay if I don't know. Uh-huh, yeah. So. But just tell him to stick with it, not to give up. That's that's life in general, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, 17 years old, you got your whole life in front of you, so. You sure Just do. have thick skin because you're in Hollywood. And he's into all this stuff. You need to meet him. I want him to well, see you bring some him of your memorabilia. Show. Bring him by the show. Exhibit. I would love to do He'd that. He'd freak if he saw that. No, he totally would. Yeah. yeah, so cool. Well, this is this is awesome. So we do this thing. It's called Hennessy Heart to Heart, where we just ask a couple questions and just kind of get your your immediate response on some of these questions. A couple of questions, okay. Yeah, simple, right? Okay. So, are you consider yourself a pessimist or an optimist? Optimist. Got it. If you can pick a new golden rule, what would that be? Um, always have an understanding heart. Okay. What, how have your values changed from 10 years ago? More sympathetic towards older people. Interesting. What do you think your greatest childhood memory is? Uh, Christmas time with my whole family. Okay. Worst childhood memory. I had a brother that died when he was a kid. That was terrible. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Uh, biggest fear as a child? Needles. Okay. Still same. <laughs> yeah. Didn't huh? change. I don't like blood tests and needles <laughs> and shots and and of course in today's world everything's injected. You know, I'm vaccinated and I'm, you know I don't look forward to that. Yeah. No, I never liked it. Uh, favorite uh, subject in in school? Um, I think. In grammar school, it was probably English, because I always loved to read. And then in high school, it was speech and geometry. I loved geometry. I'm not a math guy. Yeah. I, I'm algebra and all that, no good, but I loved geometry. And I think geometry had a lot to do with camera blocking Okay. when you're a sitcom director. But I love geometry and I love speech. I love getting up and talking. Afraid of needles, but not afraid of talking. <laughs> Go figure, right? Mm. 
What do you admire most about your parents? Uh, my father was one of the biggest stars in the world and one of the most humble people I ever met. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was fantastic. Mom? My mom was, her MO was trying to get the things for her family and her kids that she didn't have because she grew up poor and ended up like Cinderella. She married this guy to put her in this big house and took care of her and she ah. wanted to take advantage of that for her kids so she was always looking out for her kids. Okay. Uh, what are you most proud of? Um, I'm proud of my kids. I'm proud of my career. I'm proud of the fact that my hobby is part of the preservation of an aspect of Hollywood. Yeah. Um, and I'm, uh, I, I'm proud that I was able to, you know, make it in Hollywood without the help of nepotism or family. Mm -hmm. I mean, my father was entrenched in show business, but he was gone long before my brother and I got into show business. And I think we kind of made it without, which is by just working our way up okay. without having been helped by family and friends and stuff. Um, as far as like celebrities dead or alive, who inspired you the most? Well, my dad inspired me the most. Mm -hmm. Harold Lloyd really inspired me. Stan Laurel, who was a friend of mine. I loved Laurel and Hardy and I borrowed some stuff from them all the time doing shows. Hmm. So I love Stan. I love Harold. I love my dad. Um, and then I loved Michael Curtis, the director, the guy who directed Adventures of Robin Hood and Seahawk and Casablanca. He yeah. was my favorite director. Okay. Yeah. If I would ask my son that question, he would immediately say Walt Disney, for sure. Yeah, that's well, I loved Walt Disney. Yeah. No, I mean, Walt Disney, the greatest thing about Walt Disney is he was a kid. Yeah. And he listened to kids. Uh -huh. If you went to a party and he was at your house or something, your parents would go, now don't bother Mr. Disney, don't bother him. Mm -hmm. But he'd say, okay, so uh, what do you guys talk about in school and what do you like? And yeah. uh, what do you watch? And what? Do you, oh yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Cause he, that's how he made his living and he knew it and he never backed away from that. Market research. <laughs> totally, totally great guy and really smart about that. <laughs> when, if ever, is it okay to break the law? That's a tough question. Is it okay? Well, I guess it depends on what law it is. <laughs> it depends on what law it is. When is it okay to break the law? I don't know. <laughs> I don't break the law very often, so I'm not sure. I don't know. That's when I. That's I'm a not tough sure. question, right? It is. Yeah. It, again, it depends on what say, law. I would say. I would say if your uh, wife is having a baby and you're heading to the hospital, go past those stops. Oh, I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was okay to break that law. Yeah, that right? was fine. Yeah. That'd be my answer. Oh, that's a good one. Right. Yeah. Uh, what was the best birthday you celebrated? When is your birthday? May 14. Okay. Um, the best, you know what? That's a tough one to answer because I love birthdays and there's been a lot of them that have really, really been fun. Yeah. For my 65th birthday, we rented the entire bottom floor of the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. Okay. I put together a band uh -huh. of my wife, her sisters that are like a choir, the best singers ever. Uh, my brother-in-law played drums. I got a couple other studio guys. We put up a band and we played this big show. And we did it at the Roosevelt, and we had like 500 people, and it was just this huge barn burner. Huh. That was really cool. That, that was a really good awesome. one. But you know what? I loved birthdays as a kid. Yeah, right? Birthdays as a kid. A lot of stuff I did as a kid was really cool. M more magical, right? Yeah. yeah, I just loved that. I mean, I'm still a kid. So I, 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 I can tell. Yeah. Like, I seriously yeah, yeah, yeah. see that so I loved all that. So I loved all that old stuff. That was uh -huh. great. What was the best concert you've ever attended? The first one I ever went to in my whole life it was the best i ever went to which was beatles at the hollywood bowl 1964. wow that was beetle year uh -huh. so they were the biggest stars on earth sure and they were at the hollywood bowl which was one of their most famous concerts ever and by accident somebody gave me a ticket and it sit up in the boxes to go to see the beatles how cool is and that? i just like it was just it was so historic and so cool you live a fairy tale life i do friend. <laughs> i do it was really cool it was really cool Here's one. What's one of your most unusual talents that people don't know about you? Uh, that they don't know about? Yeah. Like, like I just learned that you're a musician, too. Like, what, what are some other talents? What are one of my most unusual talents? Can you talents? juggle? Can, yeah. I can't juggle. <laughs> I was a really good Sandlot football player. Okay. Very, very fast. I ran track in high school, and I did the 120 low hurdles, the 100-yard dash, the 70 high hurdles, and I was a pole vaulter. 
I was okay. a good pole vaulter. So that's a that's a that's a, an ability a lot of people don't know about. Uh -huh. But in high school, I I was a big track guy, but pole vaulting was cool. Cool. Yeah, I was always a gymnast. I loved doing gymnastics. So pole vaulting was like doing gymnastics. So I was Got always it. into that. Yeah. What's the scariest movie you ever seen? Uh. This is right in your wheelhouse here. Now you got to be careful about which one you. Uh, well, the Universal yeah. movies made meant a lot to me and influenced me a lot. But I didn't ever think they were scary. Mm -hmm. I just thought they were really cool. They really scared audiences in the '30s. Sure. Really scared them, and so I can watch an old movie and kind of assimilate into being an audience in the '30s. So I understand why the lights in Bela Lugosi's eyes scared everybody and everything. Yeah, I didn't think they were scary. I thought The Exorcist was really scary. Um, because I've never seen a movie affect an audience like that. And the funny thing about it is, a friend of mine who ran the film program at the Academy mm -hmm. of, of Motion Picture Arts and Science invited me to a screening of it on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I had a complete industry audience, which is never affected by anything. And that movie like picked up that audience and dropped it on its head and it was like, Every time there'd be this huge, loud, violent, scary thing, it would cut to something quiet, and everybody would talk and murmur. You'd hear the whole audience. Huh. So that was great. And also, John Lennon came in and sat in front of me. Yeah, that was cool. That wasn't scary. That was just cool. <laughs> um, that, I think that's probably the scariest movie. But I thought Silence of the Lambs was scary. Sure. Because of, because of the subject matter. Oh yeah. Yeah, I yeah. thought that was really scary. Oh, you know, James Wan's made some great scary movies. The Insidious is scary, The Conjuring is scary. He made a great movie called Dead Silence that nobody went to uh -huh. about a woman, an old lady that made ventriloquist dummies. Huh. That's a really scary movie. I'll have to watch that one. I haven't yeah, seen that one. Yeah, yeah. And I thought I, that's, you know, James, I think the James Wan movies are scary these days. So one that comes to mind as a kid, I would have nightmares about it uh, like every night. Uh, I don't know why I seen this or if it was just on, was Children of the Corn as a kid. Really? Yeah. Uh, Malachi, I think, was the kid's name. Yeah. Right. And I don't know, just as a kid, kind of seeing this cornfield with these kids that kind of did bad and evil things. I was but just you see, like, what's funny is for me, like for instance, there's two movies made in the very early '60s, both in CinemaScope, both in black and white. Yeah. One's called The Haunting. Okay. This was the one that Robert Wise made with Julie Harrison. Yeah. That was really scary when I saw it in a the theater when it was released everybody screamed and everything you know but that's a very cool psychological ghost story because you don't really see yeah. ghosts you just hear things uh -huh. that's one with all the pounding on the wall yeah and then there's this fantastic british film made by a guy named jack clayton with deborah kerr in it called the innocence okay and the innocence is the is a film adaption of turn of the screw by henry james and there's a thing where she thinks these two kids living in this big manor way out in the middle of the country are possessed by two people who had lived there and died. And Deborah Kerr is sitting in a gazebo in the sunlight with this little kid, who's, this little girl who's on the bank kind of humming this really weird tune. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly she hears like two voices mm -hmm. and she looks up and across this lake in the reeds is this woman in black just standing there staring at them. Huh. That's really scary. Of course. I mean, really scary. Yeah. That gives me goosebumps thinking about it. <laughs> but if I say to people, oh, the innocence is really scary, they kind of go, eh, it's this old clinker in black and white, and you know, who cares? And I, where's the guys jumping out of the closet with knives? Yeah. <laughs> so I, what scares me is a whole different thing. Got it. Yeah. The other one, too, so I grew up on Long Island, and the big one out there, I literally grew up five minutes away from the Amityville Horror House. The, oh, well, yeah. The real house. Well, that book was really scary. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the first movie, the first version of it was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought so. that was fun. It was too bad that it turned out to be a hoax. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But but I thought the book by Jay Anson that's a that's a good book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um I read that book I thought the book was scary. So yeah. and I thought some of Stephen King's books were scary. Of course. Yeah. What would you rather do? Uh go back 100 years or hop into a time time machine and go ahead 100 oh, years? Oh, absolutely no questions asked. Go back. You want to go back? Oh yeah. Yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why? I'm so interested in history. I'm so interested in the people that made the history. Um, that time period being 1920, yeah. 21, 22. I know a lot about that time. And I just think uh, the glamour of the city, what was going on, what was being built, the people yeah. doing it. I just think it's fantastic. I'm not afraid of the future, but I just think the past is so cool. It'd be cool to see like your your dad and mom too. Oh, man. Time frame, right? Yeah, go, you go shake hands with Errol Flynn. And, you know. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So That'd be cool. great. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see here. Oh, if you can jump into any movie and live in that movie for 30 days, what would it be? Uh, King Kong. King Kong. Yeah. Huh. I want to live on the island and see all the dinosaurs and see the giant monkey. Okay. <coughs> <laughs> that's what affected me so much when I was a kid. Yeah. I mean, it, you're injected into a world that's completely new and weird. And yeah. I just loved it. Yeah, I'd love to do that. That's cool. Live, live in the jungle. Yeah. 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 I think Christmas time of year, I'd like to jump into the Christmas story and kind of be in that movie for a, a, a little bit. <laughs> the one with the with the kid? With, with yeah, the, Bill, Bill and Julie. What's his name? Uh, uh, with the lamp? The yeah, yeah, lamp yeah. For Julie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. I think that would be cool. Well, thank you for, for sharing all these great stories. I would want to go back 50 years just to kind of be your best friend and kind <laughs> of hang out with you, man. Like <laughs> I had a great time. I had a lot of fun. I, again, I've been very, very, very lucky. Really lucky. So if those of that are listening want to come and see all of your pieces here and history, um, what is the name of, uh, well, there will be eventually the Hall of Fame, right? Yeah, that's going to be next to the Chinese Theater. Right okay. now, we're right down the street okay. from the Chinese at a place called Icons of Darkness. Okay, cool. And it's right next to Foot Locker on the corner of Hollywood and Highland. Yeah. Uh -huh. we're, on the, uh, we're on the northwest corner. Yeah, which is Hollywood like the Hollywood. heart of Hollywood. Right. Yes, exactly. And if you want to see some of the stuff I collected, Come on down, and you won't be disappointed. Trust me. I'm going to take my family. We're going to go. Oh, check you're going to freak for sure. Just the dinosaurs are worth coming to see. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. We will do that. Well, again, Rich, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I love doing it. Yep.